Art and money have never been separable, but somehow the idea of talking about them together has become a great taboo. We admire starving artists in a way that we would never endorse for starving teachers or starving firemen. We have a notion deeply embedded in our culture that anybody who talks about doing art for the money must not be a real artist. There's something to that, but it's also, in part, a modern concept. It certainly wasn't Dr. Samuel Johnson's view. He said, no man but a blockhead ever wrote except for money. Much of the surviving correspondence from Johann Sebastian Bach is not music theory, but complaints that his patrons wouldn't pay him on time. So we've gone from a period where artists were hyper-aware of money and open about it, to a period where artists talking about money endangers their status as artists. This would be understandable, even laudable, if artists were actually less worried about money. But since they're not, since in fact we live in a time of profound economic uncertainty about artists and arts funding, it seems suspiciously like a cultural lie designed to keep us from having to think about poverty in art. This year's Burning Man theme of Da Vinci's Workshop and Renaissance Florence is intended in no small part to violate this taboo and open this conversation. For the sake of artists and society, we need to think about how we want arts to be funded, how we can do so in ways that are consistent with our values, and how we can create the impact on the arts and funding that we want to have in the world. Does the 21st century need to have patrons? If it does, what are best practices for them? How can they be part of the solution, rather than a bottleneck for art and a source of anxiety for artists? The Renaissance teaches us that there was more than one kind of patron, and more than one reason for making art. While patronage today is virtually synonymous with getting money from a rich guy, much of the greatest works of the Renaissance were paid for by the church, and many of Florence's most significant public treasures were paid for by its various guilds. If it was a period every bit as obsessed with money as ours, it was also a period when the most powerful institutions in society saw the creation of art as central to their missions. The glory of God and the glory of the state were tied closely to the art created in their names. A nation or church without public art lacked a fundamental legitimacy. They were not doing their job. Nobility and merchants who did not engage with and support the arts were equally lacking. Money was a means to an end. Simply accumulating money served no legitimate social good. Sponsoring art, however, was an alchemy by which money transformed into a higher purpose. Ironically, we live in an era that claims to value art for its own sake, but that also sees it as far more optional than the Renaissance did. The virulent hatred held against art by Savonarola is only possible when you take art seriously. Our era has the potential for an unparalleled artistic renaissance. Not only is there plenty of money, if we can figure out how to access and harness it, but our distribution networks for art and artists are leaps and bounds beyond anything ever envisioned before. We live in a time when it is possible to experience much of the greatest art ever created for free without even leaving your home. Indeed, the ease and quality of the distribution network is part of the problem. Possibly it's an even greater problem than money. Many societies have tried to address issues of money, equality, and art before, but to my knowledge, no society in history has needed to address the problem of art and culture being too easily accessible to everyone. That seems truly a first. It may be, when we dig deep, that some issues of money may not really be about money, much in the same way some issues of sex are not really about sex. But we won't know until we call them out. We hope this theme will give Burning Man's legions of artists, doers, and creative thinkers permission to actively embrace this taboo and a space in which to explore these questions. What can we learn about the relationship between art and money from the Renaissance? And what can we do, what must we do, to embrace the potential of our own time to be the next Renaissance? 
hopefully a renaissance as concerned with human dignity and agency as it is with technical advances and artistic accomplishment. In this series of essays, leading up to Burning Man itself, we will be examining questions we hope will offer insight and inspiration to anyone looking to address these issues or take on this theme. Our history, like the histories of those before us, will be defined by our art. Virtually no one remembers Leonardo for his military engineering, but his paintings helped define an era and change the world. It is a matter of historical record that the only reason anyone really remembers the 4th Earl of Chesterfield today is that Dr. Samuel Johnson made fun of him in a letter about an art project that altered the course of civilization. It may be new technologies and economic forces that make our future possible, but it won't happen by accident. We need a new declaration of independence for artists. Leonardo viewed art as a guide to the future. He imagined things that did not exist so that he could build them. So too Burning Man. We study the Renaissance in order to imagine a new one. We imagine a new one to see if we can build it. In Black Rock City and around the world. Reimagining the relationship between art and money, artists and funding, is how we begin. <laughs>